Hello everyone, welcome back to AS and A Level Biology with Dr. Demi. I am Dr. Demi and in today's video I will continue with chapter 15 which is coordination by telling you how we generate and transmit action potentials. If you have just found this channel, please know that this is a chronological order of the Cambridge AS and A Level Biology syllabus and I'm using notes from my classroom just recording them in order to help students prepare for the exams um, and also just for you to maybe expose yourself to the content before you go to class um, or for you to just see if you can reinforce your understanding with these videos so they're mostly notes from my classroom and I hope you find them helpful something else I want to say again in this video is that I'm using the playlists function to arrange the content by chapters. So if you want to revise a specific chapter, you can just go to playlist and you would find all the chapter playlists there. So for chapter three, for example, you'd find all the videos under chapter three listed as a playlist. So you can just revise chapter three with ease or maybe expose yourself to the content before you go to class. I hope you find these very helpful. Let us get into transmission of action potentials. So in the last video, which I hope that you have watched before this one, the introductory video, I mentioned that nerve impulses are transmitted as electrical impulses. It is important to note that this is not the same as electrical cur electric current. Uh, that's because electric current has to do with a flow of electrons, whereas nerve impulses are mostly due to a difference in charge um, across the membrane of the cell. So we're going to go into detail about this, but what I want to point out is that this graph over here here is the most important graph um, in this section of the chapter. This graph shows you, I'm going to introduce it, what we call the resting potential. And the resting potential is simply when there is nothing happening within the cell. Um, the cell is at rest, you know, probably like, for example, when you're sleeping, um, your body is probably at resting potential because you're not responding to any stimuli or anything like that, um, depending on what's going on with you. And then you have this here that is called a threshold potential. And a threshold potential is usually about minus 50 millivolts over there. And that is often due to a difference in the amount of sodium and potassium ions that are moving in and out of the axon. Um, and I'm going to explain that in detail, but I just want to introduce this graph to you first. Then after the threshold potential, we have this spike over here and the rising section of the spike is called depolarization. And we have the descending side of the spike, which is repolarization. And those two combined, basically the entire spike is called an action potential. Then it goes all the way down and we have hyperpolarization over here. And then it goes back down to back up to resting potential. Now, the reason why I've told you all these different parts of the graph is because I have seen questions whereby this graph is given without any labels. And for example, they might say over here, this is A, and then they say this is B. Um, and this is C, and they ask you to write all the different parts, what the different parts represent. It's usually an easy five marks, and I don't like to see when students lose marks in that. So that is why I have introduced this video to you, this graph to you. But what I do plan to do next is to explain what happens at each of these different stages so that you get an idea of it. Now, I said on the, on the previous slide that nerve impulses are electrical impulses. They are not electrical current. And electrical impulses are due to differences in charge across the cell membrane. And so we're going to zoom in on resting potential. So we are zooming in on this part of the graph over here. Um, just that section is what we are going to look at now. In the resting potential, or what we call a resting axon, which means that the axon is not receiving any stimuli of any kind, so it is not transmitting any impulse, the inside of the axon is always slightly negative compared to the outside, and we call this an electrical potential difference. This is also what we call the resting potential. And it's easy for you to see, if you look here at this graph here where it says membrane potential, you can see that the resting potential is quite low. That is about minus 70 degrees, if I'm not mistaken. In. Um, that is the resting potential and this represents what is happening on the inside of the axon. So the inside of the axon at resting potential is more negative than the outside of the, of the axon. Now in resting potentials, resting potential is not produced by accident, okay? It's usually due to the difference in the sodium and potassium ions inside and outside the cell. You've heard of the sodium-potassium pumps throughout biology, and when we discussed 
I think action potential, not action potential, active transport, we use the sodium potassium pump as an example because it uses energy and it pumps um, materials or ions from a region of low concentration to a region of high concentration. So in this case, the sodium potassium pump has a big role to play in resting potential. What this does is that it will pump sodium ions out of the axon and for every three sodium ions that are pumped out, it pumps in two potassium um, ions. So let's look at this. Here we have sodium ions represented by this red. So I'm going to use a black pen here so that it's easy for you to see. There is a sodium ion on its way out, and here is a potassium ion on its way in. So for every three sodium ions that are pumped out, two potassium ions are pumped in. And already this kind of tells you, this kind of tells you what the difference will be, because think about it this way. Um, let's say that the inside of the cell is uh, plus seven, all right? And the outside, let's say before anything um, started happening, let's just say the outside was maybe also plus seven, all right? That's not how it is, but I'm just trying to use this to show you how the charge thing works. Now we take out three sodium ions from here and we take them out. So that would be a plus three over here. That makes this plus 10. All right. And we bring in only two potassium ions. Remember that potassium is also um, one. It's a plus one charge. Um, so here we've taken three out. We are left with, let's see, we will be left with uh, plus four because we had seven initially and we took out three, and now we've brought in two, so plus two, um, and that would leave us with plus six, okay? Whereas on the outside, it's plus 10. And this is what we're saying when we say that the inside is slightly um, negative compared to the outside in the sense that the outside has more positive charges. But what happens also besides this, just, by, just besides the action of the sodium potassium pump, is also the fact that there are potassium channels, more potassium channels in the cell membrane than there are sodium channels. And as a result of that, even the potassium ions that are brought in tend to diffuse outside. So they tend to diffuse out of the cell membrane, which means that from this plus six that we have, say we also lose maybe plus three, plus three ions just diffuse out. They don't go through the sodium potassium pump. That's something I need to tell you. They go through what we call potassium channels. So now plus three diffuses out. It means the outside becomes maybe plus 13. And over here, we are left with plus three. So again, the inside is more negative compared to the outside because the outside has more positive charges. Um, so potassium diffuses out. Um, some large negative ions will sort of bind to potassium to prevent them from moving out. But basically, the overall result is that you would find that the inside of the cell, which is this over here, this section here, I'm just circling it, is more negative um, compared to the outside. So that is what happens in resting potential. So with our understanding of resting potential, let us now look at what happens when an action potential is generated. Now, again, I want you to consider this like a story. Uh, if you've watched the videos on homeostasis where I discuss ultrafiltration and selective reabsorption, we considered it to be a story of how the body makes urine. In this video, I also want you to consider the action potential, resting potential, and all of these things to be a continuous story. So let's start with what we know about the action potential. We said that at action potential, which is this section over here, the very flat section there, at action, at resting potential rather, um, the membrane of the inside of the axon rather is more negative than the outside. And on the previous slide, I just explained to you what that looks like. We have the sodium potassium pumps that pump sodium ions out, three sodium ions, and bring in two potassium ions. That already makes the inside of the membrane of the axon slightly more negative than the outside. Then we have potassium channels in the membrane that allow potassium ions to diffuse out. So again, we are losing more positive ions from the inside to the outside. So the inside becomes more negative than the outside. That is resting potential. But now what happens when a stimulus hits the axon? When a stimulus reaches the axon, the first thing that happens is that the voltage-gated channels in the cell membrane of the axon will open. Voltage-gated channels are also channel proteins, but they are channel proteins that respond to electrical impulse. That is why they are called voltage-gated, which means that there has to be some sort of 
impulse that reaches them that causes them to open. They are very different from the potassium channels where potassium diffuses out because those channels are open all the time. But now let's look at this. The voltage gated channels will open and what would then happen is that more sodium ions will be pumped out of the cell. So at resting potential, you have some sodium ions on the outside, but now we're pumping out even more. And what this then causes is that there'll be a high concentration of sodium ions outside the cell. And these high concentration of sodium ions will result in sodium diffusing back into the cell because we've created what we call a concentration gradient. Sodium ions start to diffuse into the cell and as they do so, they would increase the charge inside the axon. So look at this, we started at a resting potential of about minus 70 millivolts. Now when sodium ions start to diffuse in, they make the inside less negative. So now we are at minus 50 millivolts. If this reaches about minus 50 millivolts, we call it the threshold potential. Once the threshold potential is hit, then the body knows that this is a serious impulse and more sodium ions will diffuse in. And that then makes the inside be to become positive. And that is what we call depolarization over here. So basically depolarization is the influx of sodium ions across the cell membrane into the, into the cell causing the um, cell to become more positive on the inside. And the cell we are referring to in this instance is the axon. So in this case, the more sodium ions come in, the more channels start to open. So basically the channels start to open um, as more sodium ions flow in. And that is what we call depolarization. And it increases the depolarization because it makes the inside of the membrane more positive. Now, I already said to you that once we reach uh, minus 50 millivolts, and in some cases they say between minus 60 and minus 50, we have what we call the threshold potential, and that then sort of pushes the cell into a depolarization state. Um, and so this takes about one millisecond, by the way, um, this depolarization over here takes about one millisecond. So we have the sodium ions flow in. So I'm just going to write here sodium um, ions. Um, I'm going to use this to represent in, all right? Um, and after that has happened, we then have the closing of all the voltage-gated sodium ion channels so that sodium ions will stop coming into the cell, into the axon. What then happens next is that the potassium channels will open and potassium ions will diffuse out of the cell. Um, so remember when we were discussing initially at resting potential, we said potassium ions do diffuse out through the potassium ion channels. But remember that there's some negative ions that hold onto some of the potassium. So in that case, those negative ions release the potassium. And so the potassium diffuses out. That is what we call repolarization over here. Um, and what that does is that it removes the positive charge from inside the cell and restores it back to its low, um, to its negative inside, which is back to the resting potential. But before this happens, we have what we call hyperpolarization. Hyperpolarization simply means that the potassium ion channels don't close quickly enough because they do close after a while. They don't close quickly enough and so we lose more potassium ions than necessary. And then we have um, what's it called the resting potential that is restored by those ions being balanced. And I know this is very confusing for many students. So what I have done is I have created a bit of an explainer video. It's an animation that I just did in PowerPoint. It's nothing hectic, no. It's not very fancy, but what I've done is it has simply, it has like everything in steps so that it, it is easy for you to follow. And I'm going to do a video on that so that you're able to follow it. Now, how do we transmit action potentials? Something I need to tell you is that no matter how strong a stimulus is, the action potential will always stay at about plus 30. All right, so if you remember from the graph we've been looking at um, over there, we start at a resting potential of minus 70, and then we get an action potential that goes up all the way to plus 30, um, and then comes back down to minus 70, which is the resting potential. 
what happens in this case is that even if you have a very strong stimulus, the action potential is not going to go beyond that. What will happen, however, is the action potential will be more frequent. So if a stimulus is weak, you would have the action potential looking like that. So it looks a bit more spaced out compared to this one, which shows a strong action potential. So a strong action potential has a higher frequency, while a weak action potential has a lower frequency um, compared to a stronger one. And what would start an action potential? Action potentials are usually begun by, uh, they begun by things like light, for example. So if, for example, you're, you're, you're asleep and someone comes and shines light in your face, and there's a chance that your eyes will receive that bright light and you start to wonder what's going on. Um, so even sound, if someone just suddenly claps next to you or they scream, uh, that is some kind of stimuli, uh, um, stimulus as well. Temperature is also a stimulus. Even chemicals, the way you respond to chemicals um, is a stimulus. Always remember that the receptor is always the first point of contact with action potentials, um, and it is the one that then helps to transmit the impulse through the sensory neuron to the relay neuron and then to the motor neuron, which then would send it to the effector. I'm going to stop here, but I want to tell you that there is a part of your um, textbook or a part of this chapter that speaks about chemoreceptors on the tongue. Um, so I usually just give that to students as reading. So I suggest that you just have a look at that. It's very short. Um, just to understand what happens in the tongue when you eat salty foods, for example, um, that's something that you want to know. In the next video, I'm going to do an explainer of action potential, resting potential, and all of that, so that it makes sense, because I'm sure this probably flew over your head, but I hope that that one is helpful. Thank you so much for watching. Until the next video, have a good time.